I suppose it was because I was a teacher. I have been a teacher for 38 years, but I'm now retired. That's about me. Now to go to the topic, Jesus, the Guru. Most of us know that in a pan-Indian way, the word Guru is actually originally from Sanskrit, meaning master, mentor, and it's in a more reverential way than we would use the word teacher. So I imagine that is why this word guru has been taken instead of the word teacher. The guru uh, initially would help as a counselor, would give not just knowledge but experiential knowledge, meaning that the students or the sishya as they are called would listen to the guru, live with the guru, and follow the, prince, the different precepts that the guru teaches, mostly through his life. And also, I see it in the context of the church as Jesus, our guru, as we, all of us read the Bible, but we also understand that this Bible is a verified text. You don't read it because it's something is a ritual, but rather because we know it is the truth. It is God-given truth. It's Holy Spirit breathed. And it's only through God's Spirit that we understand the scripture. So scriptural texts are simplified by the Guru. And this we see when Jesus came and lived among men. And when he spoke to the multitudes, he spoke through to his disciples, he was able to translate and make easier the understandings, laws of the Bible, which makes him the perfect guru. Because sometimes we see texts seem to be a little obscure, seem to be a kind of coded, but then the guru is the one who is able to make things clearer for us. There's an explanation. And the only one who's really qualified to do, is, do this is the guru. A, a spiritual guide and that is what we are also called to be. Now while I say that I was probably called as a teacher, I'm always in my life, I have been convicted by one verse in the Bible. I'm sure all the teachers here will know this verse. James chapter 3 and the first verse. If you should turn with me to James chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. This is a very convicting verse and also reminds us that as teachers, we are more answerable because what we say, what we impart, it can, cannot be just through the lips, but it has to be something that we mean, which is also an extension of when, the, when uh, Paul says, be ye not only hearers of the word, but also doers of the word. And that's what we are called to do. Jesus was a great teacher. Why do we say this? If we just reflect for a moment on our teachers, I'm sure right away in your heads, you will already classify the teachers as the ones you liked and the ones you didn't like for various reasons. Each one has their own reasons for getting attracted to a teacher. Obviously, it is not just attraction because the teacher looks nice, but the delivery of the teacher and the passion that the teacher had for the subject. I think that is the driving force. Why are we able to relate with Jesus? Because what he said, as I already said, is verified. And he was able to drive home the points to the people because he was well aware of the subject. He knew what he was saying. So we need to have this passion in our work. And uh, now I'm going to present to you a few quotes. A good head and a good heart are always a formidable contribution. But when you add to that a literate tongue or pen, then you have something very special. So here we have a dual responsibility of the teacher 
and the learner. Unfortunately, today, if we look at the education scenario, it seems to be a matter of um, just putting in knowledge into the child's head, especially schools. Because uh, those of us who teach the first year students when they come from school, we know that the first thing the students ask us is, what are the portions? What are the portions for the test? So they're so oriented towards learning for a test, learning for an exam. However, education is more than that. It is imparting of wisdom. Knowledge today is freely available. I don't think anyone will ever uh, contest that. Knowledge is available. Everybody almost has a phone, has the access to the internet. And if you ask us on a, anybody on a particular subject, they'll say, let me tell, tell you it's this. Or if you say something, especially to the younger generation, you tell them something and they will dispute and say, no, it's this. And they'll show you something from Google. It's, it's getting even more complicated today with AI and other things. It's even more complicated. Being a teacher today is not at all easy, I'm sure. The effort is more. Probably we have to thank this advancement in technology because it keeps us on our toes, keeps us always looking for a new angle, a new perspective. And I believe that being a good teacher, as we saw in this passage that was read to us from the gospel lesson, being a good teacher is first of all observing. First of all, observing. And as someone who has taught language, I would say that if you look at the child, how does the child speak? The child doesn't get up and start speaking. It listens, or he or she listens tries to understand the context, and then speaks. So too is, it is with true education. We observe, we understand, and then we absorb whatever is given to us in a textbook. The textbooks are many. Textbooks are, maybe we can even say to some extent, textbooks are to some extent redundant even with, with the coming of Google and its information, Wikipedia, this and that, probably the student won't even listen to you because the student will say, I can read it up. But that's where the teacher's role is very important. Because you can be more than just a prosaic textbook. You can present it in a different manner. Half of the information that is available on Google is not really retained. Because every time we think, it's anyway available. It's available on this little portable device. I can always verify. I can always get my knowledge. But it is something that we have to read. And that is where reading the Bible is, has shaped and formed us so well. Because when we read the Bible, we tend to kind of absorb so many things of the Bible. And our Bibles have an Old Testament and a New Testament. Jesus showed us how everything that was foretold has been, the prof, the, whatever was prophesied has come true with the Messiah and there is more to come true. That is how the Bible is something which is less like Google because that's, that's why we say that that's the only one thing that the reason we come to church is because Google can't give you that much. And also, the teacher is more like a gardener. Um, I was very fortunate to go to one island in South Africa called Robin Island. I'm sure you've heard of it. This is where Nelson Mandela, at the time, the peak of uh, apartheid, was imprisoned. And this man, in the prime of his life, was in a jail for 27 years. Just imagine, 27 years, you would think a person would be wasted. A person might need psychological help. A person might be physically, mentally, spiritually destroyed in an environment of a jail. But he, most of what he wrote really enables us to move forward. He, there is, in one 
very bleak looking court here. There's nothing there but gravel. But at the end of it, there's a small little tree, an apple tree. And there, he, it is, his court is there. To plant a seed, watch it grow, to tend it, and then harvest it, offered a simple and enduring satisfaction. The sense of being the custodian of a small patch of earth offered a taste of freedom. Now just look at that. So he's, it, as the tree grows, it emulates its environment as did that apple tree. And he also says, like the gardener, and we definitely know that the Lord is a, a gardener, Jeremiah tells us that one man sows, one man, there, and someone else reaps it. Like the gardener, a leader must take responsibility for what he cultivates. He must mind his work, try to repel enemies, preserve what can be preserved, and eliminate what cannot succeed. I would say that is the best definition of education. Growing, understanding what is around you, and not just blaming this or blaming that. Because oftentimes we've heard people saying that, I didn't have the best of circumstances, that's why it is so. But it is within us to want to learn, the desire to learn, the desire to move forward. Why is it that we have so many success stories? Why is it that right in the Bible we see the simplest person becoming greater? Because there is the passion and the desire to be, to make a change, to be the change. Because change is the only thing that is, as you say, I mean it's a cliche, permanent. Now in this uh, Bible reading that we um, read, what really uh, came across was the authority of Jesus. The authority of Jesus. Teachers should have authority, meaning all of us, are at some point, a teacher to somebody, a mentor to somebody. Do we have that authority or do we have to keep looking back, going back to something? Do we know our subject? Do we know our area of expertise well enough? Or are we always falling back on someone, on something? Jesus here had authority and that authority made the evil spirits also to understand that they were not, that if the, the people understood that when they were free from the evil spirit, they would be able to move forward. As we, he, he demonstrate the power of authority and also the power of love. He cared, he cared for those who were the evil spirits and he wanted he really wanted to fight against evil. Today, that's what is important. We need to not just sit and get knowledge and get knowledge, but learn to understand how that knowledge can give us empathy and create a new scenario against injustice. I think that's the one word that covers so much. Uh, there are days when I stop reading the newspapers because there's nothing but that. The newspapers don't have anything good, okay? so. It's one thing to know about things and another thing to act. And to really act in scenarios that are dark and are obscure. All of us can identify to that. Things that shouldn't be happening are happening around us. There's so many things that we want to really cry out against. But you can't just make a noise there, but you have to only use love and empathy. And that's the true teacher that Jesus was. His words had the power to touch, to transform, to heal, and set free all those who believe in him. There's a condition there, all those who believe in him. So we just don't say that these are the words of God, but it's up to us to take it and believe in it. When we believe in it, then there is darkness dispelled, light that comes in, meaning in our day-to-day -day lives. And we are able to Every one of us is going through battles, struggles, obstacles. It may be physical, it may be mental, but all of us do have on our daily lives something that is nagging us, something that is eating us. And that is why when we come together, we are very blessed to be able to come to a church and cast 
and talk to others, worship as a congregation, and understand that Lord, the Lord is there strengthening us, motivating us. The word of the Lord is there, when we, which we study every day alone, but when we come in corporate worship, that is something else. We understand that different people are going through different things. I don't have to make a big show of my problem, or I don't have to be bogged down by my problem. There are people going through worse situations, worse circumstances. It's not the situation or the circumstance, but it's going from it that makes us better. And Jesus had battles and struggles against evils, against so-called leaders of the synagogues, but he was able to do all of that. And I think he's challenging us in our lives. These words tell us that he's challenging us to commit our life completely to him. So we also should have this power, this authority to conquer evil, to live a life of faith, to live, live a life where love and empathy are central in our behavior. Today, he wants us to do soul-searching exercises with, his, with the scripture. And we should ask ourselves, is there something I should do to increase my own faith before I go to talk to someone? Should I do something to increase my faith more? What is it that prevents me from having a better relationship with God and a, therefore a better relationship with those around me? What is a sin or the demon from which I need to be freed? I need to be able to tell that demon, go, get out of this. I have to tell my demons. I have to get rid of my demons first. What, is it, what are these demons? We should see what they are. Because oftentimes we just let the, tr the problem or the trouble that we are facing take over. We don't identify and we don't try to do anything about it. Sometimes we even talk to the wrong people about it. Or we pray and we still go on talking about it. What does Jesus want you and me to do today? What is, how does he want us to approach these situations? Because we see Jesus who was outside the demons, then he went and healed Simon Peter's mother's mother-in-law, so he had this concept of empathy. Not just telling, but also living with people and doing things that will bring about change. Healing is something that I know there is the power of the word and the power of also reaching out to the person. Why is it that we like to go to somebody to pray and not just pray with anybody? Because we know that the sincerity of prayer, the desire will be answered when we pray together in a certain sense of commitment and understanding that that person has authority. I also get that authority when we pray together. So I would think that we need to be, understand that he is our teacher. And just like Jesus says, that we are also of the royal priesthood. We are also people who bear his name. So as students, the student does become a teacher too. And the Bible is full of instances where people reach out to others. Look at St. Paul, look at Stephen, especially the New Testament. We have a lot of them. We have them right from the Old Testament. So when we are able to move out of our situations at home, just not saying that I know this, I have this information, and I am free, but how can I go out and make others free? That's a very important thing because it is knowledge does not, uh, just information does not give us enough power. Neither does knowledge, but it's the discernment, the wisdom that comes in discerning that gives us power. And it's amazing how uh, King Solomon, when he was a child, what did he ask for? Not for riches, not for anything else, but he only asked for the power of discernment. And that made him get everything else. Of course, as as a human being, he did have his failings, but we understand that all the heroes, all the faith heroes of the Bible, everybody tells us where, how far we can go with our faith, how far we can go with our commitment, 
how far we can go with the spirit of discernment and how far Jesus goes along with us when we are sincere, when we have the same empathy he has. Unfortunately, we tend to get, I often think that when situations, if I were there, we would have immediately given ourselves a million excuses or we would have labeled people saying, X, Y, Z is like that. I can't go beyond that. But Jesus did not have any labels. Though there were people who were hard-hearted, he called them hard-hearted, but he still went out to speak. He still spoke. He still had avenues to help people turn back. So what is, we? let's do our soul searching and see how can we be a better mentor, a better friend, especially as today, students do not come just for subject knowledge. They want more than that. I'm sure all teachers know that. The subject knowledge is important. I don't say that you come to your class and you can dance away your time. But apart from your lecture, they're looking for something more. And that's the something more that Jesus was able to give. He not, just, he not only just taught, but he spent time. He spent time with children. He sp spent time with... He was also revealing himself to the shepherds, to the pig herd, to everybody. So, and he also used a lot of stories in speaking to them, the parables, the uh, earthly stories with the heavenly moral. That's what we are taught in Sunday school. So he used a lot of that. So as he is such a perfect teacher, we should also strive to take the qualities of this Lord, whom we all claim so fervently and live a life as sincere and fervent as him. That is my prayer to everyone and especially for all the teachers whom I would like to say wish you a very happy Teacher's Day as, and I think many people come into the bunch of teachers because we're all teaching somebody or the other, especially parents are teachers, the first teachers from home are the parents. So as we contemplate on this subject as Jesus as our guru, may we go back and may we read our Bibles with different perspectives to see how our guru has impacted us and where are the areas in our lives where we need more power and authority, more love, more empathy, more sincerity to go down to the deep roots of the problem so that we can, especially as we're living in a world where there's a lot of darkness. People are still so superstitious. I don't know whether you're living in areas where at 11 o'clock in the night, people are bursting crackers to ward off evil spirits. So we know that so much of, despite education, okay, so-called education, people are still shrouded with a lot of ambiguity of paganism or the spirit of wanting to do something against one another and also believing in superstition, living continually in darkness. So we are called on to be little lights to dispel the darkness of the areas we are in. As in Jeremiah, in such a troubled situation of the exile, what was the word of God? You go, build your homes, plant your gardens, continue your life. Instead of I think that, is a, that came across very powerful to me, powerfully to me during a study because we are always grumbling about situations around us. But are we doing our work sincerely? That's the reminder for us. Let us build our homes. Let, when it says home, it's not a house but a home. So let that home of ours be something which is welcoming, where we are able to interact with people, show that love, our faith must come out in action, I think. That's something we all need to work on. Easier said than done, but it's something we all need to work on so that we may plant our trees, plant our gardens. We may, we may not reap the fruit of it, but God calls on us to continue to do the right thing, not stand and point fingers at others, but are we doing what we should be doing? And then he will bless us abundantly as to be good teachers, to be good mentors, and to understand the other person. Because the teacher's role, as I said, and I, I, I think I said it many times, is not only imparting the knowledge, but also 
students watch what we do. I feel here I must say something, but once I think there was somebody who was, okay, this is just an instance from me, who was pestering me for something, and I just told my son, just tell that person I'm not at home over the phone. So he came back to me on it and he said, wasn't that a lie, mummy, that you said that I'm not there? So we are giving those gray areas. We are, I provided it for my children. So we have to be careful in what we do, what we say, how we say it, where we say it, and try to live a little more blamelessly than yesterday. That's all I can, none of us is perfect, but we can try to rectify on maybe one or two areas that need a little bit of spring cleaning so that we understand that those who see us, those who watch us, are enabled and not um, impacted negatively by what we do and what we say. With these words, I'd like, to, I'd like us to pray together a prayer which I have uh, taken from uh, Daniel, uh, Reverend Daniel. Let us close our, bow down before our Lord. Lord, our Heavenly Father, as we have come here together, we ask that you will enable us to be less distracted by the things that take us away from you, that take us away from the truth, and help us to be impacted in a way that we will be better persons, better teachers, better mothers, fathers, children, wherever you have placed us, whatever we are doing, help us that we may be better impacted. The prayer goes as, we thank you for your presence in our lives, dear Lord. We praise you, Lord, for the wisdom bestowed on every leader of the Bible. And we ask you, Lord, to help us find joy in your perfect plan. We do not know your plan, but we see it unfolded in our lives each day. Allow us to praise and love each other through faith in you, O Lord. Shield us from all evil through your word, through your salvation, and through our prayers. Guide us to abide by the truth as we spread the good news to one and all and lead the lost to you. We pray, O Lord, that you will continue to bless us. Bless our lives and fill us with hope. We ask you, Lord, to guide our footsteps and lead us to the way everlasting. Through faith in you, O Lord, we seek salvation and we seek a place with you in heaven according to your ways, your everlasting wisdom and your strength. May your will be done here on earth and through this vast universe. May our hearts be filled with gratitude for your everlasting love and grace. All praises, all glory to you, Lord our Master. Amen. Thank you.